Well, it's another online explorations with Althea Center Denver in Colorado, and hopefully I will get to see some of my, or at least see notes from some of my dear, dear friends and Althea family here today. This actually, uh, this class is actually, or group discussion, whatever you want to call it, is really uh, something that we do live and in person every week at Althea. And usually it's a group of about 12 to 16 pretty diehard regulars that get together to explore some core themes in what it means to balance being human and spiritual, or what does it mean to be a spiritual human or a human spirit. And uh, uh, I talk a little, and then there's just always a fantastic time for sharing and discussion, and I'm sorry that we can't do it in this format. But if you'd like to send questions or comments, you can write them, and uh, they will post, and then our dear Susan, who uh, manages our center at Althea, she will take those, and she will send them to me in an email, and I will find it right here. Sound good? Hey. Susan is watching. So um, a shout out to any of our regular Explorations group members. Thank you for being here. And to anyone else who's dropping in for the first time, we're grateful to have you with us. Please remember you can learn more by exploring our Facebook page, Althea Center Denver. You can check out our website, altheacenter.org. And you can even make donations anytime, day or night. You wake up in the middle of the night, you're bored, you're trying to think of something to do, you feel like you just have too much, too much wealth and abundance and you just need it to go somewhere important, you can go online and you can donate to us or you can do that right now. So I think uh, that's enough of a delay for everyone to get online and get situated. I'm going to slow us down. We're going to take a breath. I'm going to do a reading, and then we're going to dive into what I, what I actually think is a kind of cool topic for today, um, but I'm going to save it. I'm going to save it. I'm not going to tell you until we get there. All right. Are you ready, everyone? Susan, if you're ready, send me an email. Okay. You know the deal, everyone. Eyes closed. Sit comfortably but alert. And let's start with just a big... Big breath in and big kind of sigh, just a relief and a release out. <sighs> Feel the muscles in your face relax. Feel your shoulders drop. And feel the busyness of your mind subside. Feel the quietness in your heart begin to grow and just let yourself settle in to a silent place within. Just take this moment to connect with stillness and silence intentionally and with no purpose other than simply to be embraced by the silence. And we remember that it is in this silence that we find each other and our powerful connection to all things. For this silence within is the same in every one of us, in every person, place, and dimension. And so we are together in this moment, whoever is watching, whoever is listening, regardless of when in this moment we are together. And in this moment we are together, not only with each and every one who hears these words, but with everyone we've ever loved, with everyone who's ever guided us, with every beautiful place we've ever been. So 
all together now. And so I encourage you to stay with your eyes closed as you hear the words of this simple reading by uh, Saint Francis de Sales, Saint Francis de Sales, as people say in English. <clears throat> Be patient with everyone, but above all with yourself. Do not be disheartened by your imperfections, but always rise up with fresh courage. How are we to be patient in dealing with our neighbor's faults if we are impatient dealing with our own? They who are fretted by their own failings will not correct them. All profitable correction comes from a calm and peaceful mind. Wow. Well, you can open your eyes, come back to the room, and uh, every now and then I'm going to kind of look down and make sure I'm on track with time, and uh, make track, make sure there's no nothing urgent coming up. So, it's about ten after eleven here, and we'll we'll be going till about eleven fifty or so. And what I wanted to share today is is really relating to the fact that now more and more and more of us have been asked, obligated, or invited into a kind of quarantine. For some of us, we've been doing this uh, for, I've already been doing this for three weeks, my friends, three weeks. Um, but there are many people who continued to work or have lived in places where uh, they, you know, didn't have the obligation or didn't see the reason but more and more it's happened that uh, we are all coming to a place of this this self-imposed limit, this quarantine. And, and so we're each going to be in different stages and phases of this. But what occurred to me is that for those that have been doing this for longer, it's very important to know that no matter how long this goes on, it's going to move through stages and phases, stages and cycles. The process of being in seclusion, the process of being in deep introspection, moves through a kind of cyclical progress, a certain kind of um, ebb and flow, you might say, of energy. Now, we did address this a little bit in the Sunday, I think it was the Sunday service, where we talked about three movements of energy in life. I, I can't keep this stuff straight. So there is the, the consciousness of the self that engages the world, and it moves through cycles. There is the consciousness of the soul, or the innermost self, and it progresses and evolves. And then there's the consciousness from which we come, which is a still point. So there's these three energies, three kind of trajectories of consciousness. One that is a cyclical progression, the other that is a kind of evolutionary progressive line, and the other which is a still point. And the still point is the same in any moment of any cycle or progression. On Friday, some of you are going to be joining me for a Zoom class, 90 minutes, and we're going to specifically talk about saints and sages and shamans and how they understand or even create, even seek out the desire for quarantine. But today, what I wanted to sort of contribute to that, you know, something in the middle of these two things, is the idea that it might be helpful to think of your time as a quest. Now, we've talked about this in the Althea community before, and I've even done a Sunday service or, or gathering, or whatever you want to call it, a Sunday message, talking about life as a quest. You can look at your quarantine as a quest as well. So what that means, first of all, in a broad sense, and then I'm going to kind of walk you through the stages again, and then we can get into a bit of a discussion. But what that means in a broad sense is that you're going to have to expect, you're going to have up days 
and down days. You're going to have days, especially if you're on this spiritual path of self-awareness and awakening, you're going to have days that are going to feel amazing. You're, you're calm, you're connected, you're, you're, you're painting mandalas and singing songs and you're, you know, you're feeling the presence of life and energy with you and all around you. That's great. It doesn't mean you failed if two days later you can barely get out of bed. You know, you feel haunted by your past. You're, you're, you're scared about where this is going. That is a, that is a very particular condition um, that's been well researched. This kind of going from high to low and feeling like you failed even though it was good just a minute ago. And I believe that, that researchers in psychology and social studies call this uh, normal. I think that's what it's called. Being human. So if you're experiencing these kinds of ebbs and flows as you go through your quarantine, it's okay. That's the most important thing to know. Not only is it okay, but it's, it's necessary. It's a part of how we grow and evolve. It's a part of how energy moves and cycles and refreshes and disintegrates and reintegrates. There's no um, real growth or transformation available to us in this process if we don't actually have those kinds of things. So this is the first important principle for today, which is ups and downs, highs and lows, uh, feeling celebration and failure is all a part of what you should be going through as you are locked up in the confines of a much smaller life than normal. <clears throat> The challenge or the opportunity is to not only be aware of those things so you can be gracious and patient when they happen, but to also understand that it all serves a purpose. It all serves a purpose that you can participate in intentionally. And in that way, you can enrich the cycle, enrich the change, and even, you might say, get more out of it. That's why I like to say, that if you adopt a quest consciousness, and by quest, sure, you can think Vision Quest, you can think King Arthur, you can think Luke Skywalker or Ray for the new folks on the scene. Um, <clears throat> you can think Goldilocks, maybe? No, maybe not Goldilocks. But the point is that if you embrace quest consciousness, then it holds everything that goes on in your experience as not only acceptable, lovable, forgivable, but a part of getting you somewhere. All right, so are we clear? Does anybody have any important interjections or questions? You're going to have to type real quickly so that we can transcribe them and they'll get sent to me. I'm not seeing anything just yet. Waiting, waiting, waiting. All right. So let's continue. What does the hero's journey typically look like? So the most famous scholar who ever examined this was Joseph Campbell, uh, a world famous mythologist. I can't think of anyone more amazing to read while you're in quarantine than Joseph Campbell. Of course, there are people equally as amazing. I would recommend Rilke. I would recommend Jack Cornfield. I would absolutely recommend Pema Chodron. Probably eh, like a little bit more than even Joseph Campbell. Pema Chodron is a magnificent companion to what we're going through. Uh, P E M A um, Chodron. C H O R D A N, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> But in, 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 in religious studies and the study of myth throughout history and time, we have, we have seen the archetypes of scripture, legend, sacred story, and folktale mapped again and again and again. And Joseph Campbell was probably the most notable who distilled all these maps and explored all these stories to find the most consistent themes. Now, when you hear them, they're going to sound so obvious, but just hang on a second. 
They may be obvious in retrospect, but for those of us living them, because myths may appear in story and art, but they represent the architecture of life itself. So, myth does not mean false, right? So, a lot of people have come to say, oh, it's a myth, meaning it's not true, right? Fact or myth. That, ironically, for someone who's apparently promoting facts, is a completely inaccurate, uneducated use of the word myth. A myth is true metaphorically. So myths are truthful, but it's metaphorical. So that's the first thing you need to understand as you embrace the quest of your life, as you embrace the quest of your quarantine. Yes, your quarantine can be seen mythically, mythically, which means everything that you're going through can be a part of a journey, a test, a challenge, a great time of healing and awakening. Your life is a myth. So just as the stories, <clears throat> whether it's Wizard of Oz, uh, you know, or a biblical story, or a story from Hindu tradition, or, or uh, again, you know, Star Wars, Marvel characters, and so on, just as these are metaphorical of the journeys in our own lives and the struggles in our own lives, so too are the struggles in our own lives our own actual lived experiences, they are also mythical at some level, as they are metaphors for the landscape of the inner world. <clears throat> so did you get that? The daily lived experience, what we call reality or normal life or the real world, is in fact itself just a reference, a metaphor for the inner landscape of the self, the spirit, energy. That is what is ultimately real. And it evolves and grows according to how we relate to our life story. And our life story evolves and grows as we relate to the myths that have been given to guide us. Isn't that kind of cool? So, spirit grants us the myths through creativity and intuition. The myths become these external stories that then inform how we look at our real lives. And the experience of our real lives becomes the playground, the classroom, for the only thing that's really going on, which is the evolution of the soul. I think that's kind of cool. From there, <clears throat> let's look at what are these steps. So, the story is pretty universal. We have a hero, so that's you. And that could be, you know, the little boy, the little girl, the, the whatever, main character, who is in some situation that's called normal, right? So, these stories always start off with, you know, butterflies in the meadow, and, uh, you know, deers hopping through the grass or whatever it is, but then something changes. So we have a new element introduced into normal. Some uncertainty. Now, it could be a villain. It could be a plague. It could be a drought, a disaster, a virus. That's not a stretch, right? Throughout the world's uh, mythical traditions, throughout the world's scriptures and stories, uh, something like what we're facing is pretty commonplace. It's usually something that's pretty epic. Life as we know it is being threatened. Now that's critical. Life as we know it is being threatened. On the inner level, what this is starting to signify is that normal is not okay. That normal without growth invites disaster. This is part of the hidden code in the myth. Why does the foreign force come in? It's to show us that happily ever after doesn't last. Not in a growing, healing, mature, awakened community or individual. 
Change is introduced. Challenge is introduced. And that is specifically so that we can grow. The urge to grow is so strong that at some level it is we in ourselves that are inviting and creating the impending disaster. In a weird way, this is how we're looking at the pandemic we're facing right now. No one really, I mean, there's all kinds of debates and opinions, but no one really creates a virus and no one really is to blame. It's not a Chinese virus. It's not a bat virus. It's not a pangolin virus. I mean, everything, everything has a beginning that goes back beyond the mind. But we know that we have created conditions that have made us vulnerable. We've created economic disparity, debt, and hand-to-mouth living all over this planet that feeds the bellies of the billionaires and yet leaves the vast majority of people alive today so vulnerable if there is ever a setback or some kind of interruption to our economic life. So that is a great example of the conditions in a mythic story. Or we become unconscious of how interconnected we are, that we touch each other, that we come close to each other, that our words, our deeds, our cleanliness, our proximity, all these things are examples of our constant interconnection, interpenetration, interdependence, and we forget those. So what you start with in the mythic story is kind of the lulling, peaceful sense of the ordinary and then the interruption, the threat to the self, the village, the community, and so on. This is the point where the hero moves out of the village. And it usually happens through one of two reasons. Either they are seeking a solution for the problem. So I will go and find Luke Skywalker. I will, you know... I. Sorry, I just keep using the Star Wars myths. I will go find the Horcrux. I think that's a thing in Harry Potter. Um, you know, I will go find Gandalf. Whatever. You got to go find someone or something that's going to help the problem. Now, the other reason why people will leave the village, so to speak, leave normal, is that they are simply forced out. Right? Like now the village is on fire, or the enemy has descended, or whatever it is. But in some ways it's kind of the same thing. More or less, you're forced to find something new and leave normal. This is when the hero then enters the wilderness. Now the wilderness takes on all kinds of settings, and of course, this uh, theme replays in urban stories as well. It's not just, you know, space and fairy tales. But wilderness signifies, in this case, not the beloved wilderness of my heart, you know, the, the, the beautiful natural world, but the wilderness that is filled with uncertain, right? So now, the hero, you, enter a time that you haven't been in before, a space you haven't been in before. Everything you've known is now being taken away and all you've got is your little hobo pack and, you know, your little flask of, of uh, water or juice or <laughs> wine, whatever. And, and, and you're wandering without a sense of where to go or what's next. Now, this is interesting because as many of us moved into quarantine, that was very much like that first stage, a little bit of bewilderment. Like, is this really happening? Some of us a bit delighted. Oh, we can sleep in. Oh, we can spend more time outside. Or with family, it's unfamiliar, but maybe it's not so bad. Until it continues. So as the journey goes on, you know, the first night falls, and the hero now encounters all kinds of junk that they did not expect. So it turns out that the wilderness does not necessarily feel safe, right? So there's hostile elements, there's cold, there's heat, there's rivers to cross, there's ravines to overcome. All of a sudden we discover that to leave what is normal is not comfortable. 
And that's the most important next sort of element here. Yes, challenge. And it comes in all kinds of forms. And believe me, when you see the monsters that show up in movies, you must relate down into yourself. These are the monsters that arise when we are left alone. When we are left alone to our own home, our smaller circle, we will move from the blissful embrace of our freedom. Oh, maybe it's not so bad to be footloose and fancy free on this journey to, oh my gosh, I can't believe what's hiding in the shadows. So very much a reference uh, directly to the shadow of the self. All the demons start to come out. And that is when you need to fight. Now, fight is metaphorical. It means you need to find resolve. You need to find courage. You need to find motivation. You need to remember why you're doing this in the first place. And all of a sudden, good things start to happen. So you find little gifts. You find new teachers, right? This is exactly what every epic quest is about. At this stage in the journey, you're gathering your tools and resources. So now you're doing uh, classes with Jonathan. Now you're doing online courses with Jack Cornfield. Now you're digging out some of your old favorite books and journals. Now you're remembering uh, an old video someone lent you and you never had the time to watch. Or maybe it's just painting or embracing some old talent but there's this kind of phase of collecting the tools. And as you collect the tools on the journey, some will be internal and some come with guidance. So in the mythic uh, outline, we have the gathering of tools. And typically this is when teachers are showing up. I kind of consider them a part of the same thing because it's all stuff to help you make progress. All right, if you're still with me, you can send a little note. You can say, hi, keep going. I got it. Smiley face, smiley face. Because I ain't stopping till someone tells me, well, until a whole bunch of you tell me to stop. Okay, so here you are. You are now at home. Okay, this is now you on the quest. And you are finding some of the tools and resources. You are remembering, oh, I used to like to dance and now I'm doing it in the living room every day. Oh, I used to be in touch with a dear old friend from university or high school or work. And I can do that again. So you're, you're gathering the resources and you're building the enthusiasm again. And so this is, now pay attention, right? This is already an example of the ups and downs. Up, life is normal, all is well. Normal life is threatened, down. We, uh, we have to leave in the middle of the night or something forces us into a new uh, setting, down. But then, maybe it's not so bad, right? Couch isn't so bad, going for walks isn't so bad, reconnecting with old friends, up. Now it's getting boring. Now we're starting to be haunted by our busy mind. Now we're regretting not spending more time working on ourselves because we're reviewing old relationships and, and failures and things we wish we could have done or should have done down. And then we go online or we get out for a walk and we have a little inspiration. We find a teacher, a tool, a book kind of went through that already. And we go back up. We can do this. We connect with other people online. We feel the strength of what's happening. And I love this because this is a part of every modern American superhero movie, right? Even the superhero themselves, who started downtrodden Captain America, downtrodden the Hulk, downtrodden Batman, downtrodden Aquaman. They all start beaten down and then they begin this wild ride of ups and downs and just when you build your confidence in them you remember this was like really big in the 80s and 90s there was always that like five minute montage of the hero with the new tools and the mentor and they're like you know punching blocks of ice and they're you know lifting 
tree trunks and doing all this shit like a week of training is going to turn them into Superman. But anyway, right? It's mythical. So we're feeling some good energy. And then all of a sudden, we come face to face with the true magnitude of the challenge. Because remember, while you were starting to feel better, the bad guys were also progressing with their plan. And all of a sudden we discover, oh no, it's not just one army of darkness, but every army of darkness in the history of civilization in all dimensions of the universe, and they are coming to destroy the planet. Oops, maybe I didn't train enough, right? So whatever it is, the hero acquires the master, acquires the tools, moves into this new claiming of power, and then boom, set back again. Now, what does this look like at your home? Well, this means that if all of a sudden, after a really great week or a couple of days, you're suddenly down in the dumps again, it's okay. It's okay because little by little, more is coming out to be healed, right? So more comes from the shadow. It is revealed to be healed. And if it's daunting, if it's draining, if you feel even debilitated at times by the magnitude of uncertainty, it's fine. It's fine. Because it is the realization of our disconnect, areas of brokenness, pieces that have been hidden in the shadow that actually creates the draining experience itself. In other words, at a subconscious level, you are sorting through a lot. So be patient with yourself. Nurture yourself. When you're feeling down, just let yourself feel down. If you need to have a bath, light some candles, have some more junk food and watch some fun movie, give yourself just a little time of denial so that you can get through this, gather more perspective, and get back to work. So we're not doing this for long, but you're going to give yourself a little bit of that denial phase, a little bit of that self-medication phase, a little bit of it. And you're going to prepare yourself for what's next. Now remember, in the great quests and, and the films and the stories, same thing. In fact, this is usually when the hero wants to run away, right? I can't do it. You trained me, but this is bigger than all of us. You trained me, I didn't think, I, I thought I could do it, but I can't do it, right? You, you've seen this a thousand times. This is us, the moment of doubt, the moment of despair. Can we really get through what's next? And of course, if you paid attention to any of these stories, the answer is always yes. Of course you can, because you're not doing it alone. You never do it alone. As alone as the hero appears, as alone as the hero feels, it is the collective consciousness that they draw from in order to triumph. Now, more and more in contemporary film, because people are studying the myths, they are depicting it as literally the collective being necessary for the triumph. Now, I hate to use all these modern metaphors, but the most popular, highest grossing movie in the history of time was this Avengers movie, uh, Endgame, you know, the two-part conclusion. But the whole message at the end was that no one hero can do it alone. And that ultimately is the conclusion. So whether it's Moses and God, or Jesus and God, or, you know, whatever it is, We've all got a team somewhere that we're drawing from, and the ultimate team that we are waking up to is not a human team at all. It's realizing that when we are most alone, we can still draw from the strength of all that has gone before us. In fact, in what I think was the rather brilliant conclusion, at least spiritually speaking, of the Star Wars series, in the final movie of the final trilogy, sorry if you haven't seen this yet, but it is precisely this realization that leads to the triumph of light over dark. I'm not going to totally expose it because it's worth, I think it's worth watching. All the hero themes 
are right there in this movie. Of course, George Lucas studied Joseph Campbell. I believe they actually met. Um, but Ray has to realize more than being the chosen one, that what being the chosen one means is that you are implicitly linked to all those that depend on you and all those that love and support you. And in that way, everyone is the chosen one. Because our journey, our light, our radiant consciousness is our gift to the world. And we will each share that in different levels and degrees. But make no mistake, every single person hearing this has the ability to wake to their place as hero in their own story. It'll look different, sound different, be understood different, but we are all in that same place. And so we reconnect with purpose, we reconnect with meaning, and face the next challenge before us. Now, typically in a quest story, a myth, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. But in the human journey, this all repeats, which means, yes, you are going to have some very dark nights. You are going to have some great realizations if you're treating this all mindfully, consciously, purposefully. And you're going to have some, um, you're going to have some uh, uh, moments in which you doubt the whole process and repeat the cycle again. So great highs, great lows, and constant evolution. Now the trick is this. If you know this story, then you know not to get attached to any part of it. Which means when things are good, enjoy it for what it is, but don't sell the farm, as they say. Don't believe that that's the place you're going to stay forever because things are going to change. Someone you know and love is going to get sick. You might get sick. Something financial is going to crash. We don't know what's coming. So enjoy every, for lack of a better word, up moment or good moment as much as you can and know it may pass. It will pass. And know that every dark moment is not a final statement on who or what you are. It too will pass. All we can do is stay with the core intent of the hero and the quest, which is to learn and learn and learn. Gift after gift, lesson after lesson. And ultimately, this is how the hero stories conclude, which is... We take our gifts back to the village and restore balance. We come to a new normal infused with all the lessons of the hero. So it's not just defeating the enemy. It's not just finding, you know, whatever the magic crystal is or destroying the magic crystal or whatever it is. It is the gift to humanity, self, culture, village that that signifies, and bringing it back for restoration. And of course, we all have memories of that final scene, right? It's always the final scene of Lord of the Rings or the Marvel movies or DC comic or whatever it is, or going back into folk tales and fairy tales. The hero, often with their new friends, sometimes literally with their physical gifts, um, and they go back to the village and, and, and share them, and the village is transformed and everyone celebrates. So, we're going to turn to questions now. We've got about 10 minutes for questions. Um, the first one is, how is the mythic narrative presented within indigenous cultures? So the fascinating thing that Joseph Campbell revealed is that this archetype is absolutely global. So he, he looked at indigenous cultures, he looked at Eastern traditions, he looked at Western traditions, and we see this absolutely everywhere. The main thing that seems to be distinct between indigenous Eastern and Western traditions is how they interpret 
their own myths. And whether they believe them to be literally true or whether they recognize that they are in fact myths. Now we can't really know what indigenous people believed before written history, but it does seem that all three categories of human culture, indigenous, eastern, and western, um, in the early years, it seems that they basically all believe that their mythical stories are literally true. So their cultures are organized around participating in the culture with the heroes, right? With the supernatural beings as though they were actually in their lives. For example, when you go to Mayan communities, I mean ancient Mayan communities and temples, you'll see they are organized not only with architecture and imagery to remind us of the spiritual world, but they are actually built in a way so that the spiritual world can participate in ordinary life. And of course, it's not very different when we look at mosques and cathedrals. So the first point is to say, we can't, we can't say that the indigenous people lived in a magical realm and it was all, you know, mythical and ordinary were intermeshed, but now it's different. Actually, that's been the predominant way that religions hold their myths originally. In all traditions, we also find that there are subsets of both individuals and, you might say, societies or communities that come to recognize that these myths are actually instructive for the well-being and transformation of individuals and community, that they can't be um, engaged from a place of ego or constricted consciousness, that all myths and stories must be engaged from a place of evolutionary understanding. How do they help us organize the infinite energies of life? And how do they see those same things playing out in ourselves. Now, the other thing that I'll add about indigenous cultures today is in my experience, and if I'm not indigenous, um, although I've spent all of my life being, well, since I was a teenager, being in relationship to indigenous communities and friends and family. Um, what's very clear to me is that indigenous communities by and large have continued to celebrate and embrace the importance and significance of ancient mythology and sacred stories. In other words, it's my experience that modern indigenous tradition has come to understand the function and value of myth, and so they hold on to it with language, with story, with ceremony, and so on. Whereas in the Western world, as Houston Smith, a great scholar of religion, has suggested, we have replaced our ability to embrace mythology um, transpersonally with a kind of scientism. Scientism is not the embrace of science gifts. It's actually the up, um, upholding of the mythology of science as fact. And of course, that's absurd because even science knows that everything it believes to be true is disproved, refined, or changed now, often within a matter of a year and sometimes even less. So the point is that Houston Smith would say that science has become the modern mythology by which we orient all our answers. And even in the time of the pandemic, I think it's quite obvious that science is a work in progress, much in the same way that any mythology is a device to help us deal with the inner world, but it must be related to with adaptability and responsiveness and a kind of self-reflection. We've been told this is passed by, you know, uh, aerosol through the air. No, this is passed with the hands. We need the masks, we don't need the masks, we need the gloves, we don't need the masks, uh, gloves, young people can't get sick, young people are getting sick. <clears throat> you know, it's a learning process. It doesn't mean science is wrong. It just means that true science is a learning process. 
the integration of true mythology in any self or society is also a learning process. So one of the great things that indigenous cultures demonstrate today is that they ha have by and large not replaced the wisdom of their ancient traditions to help them come into right relationship with self, each other, and the planet for a scientific worldview. It's interesting to note that Joseph Campbell himself believed that this is, was or is the greatest peril of the modern world, which is the loss of myth. And the idea that myth today is being created by marketing executives and built on the framework of science rather than being generated from the intuitive, imaginal realm in which we connect to higher powers or non-human beings for the myths themselves. And again, that would be a big distinction between modern um, Western and modern indigenous tradition. Um, the, the next question, and, and please, if there's any more questions, squeeze them in now because we just have a couple more minutes. The next question is, uh, how do you take care of yourself as a teacher? Um, gosh, I guess I don't. <laughs> I was just going to say, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> I think probably one of the most significant things that comes to me first when I think about how have I cared for myself as a teacher over the years is to ensure that there is absolutely never, ever, ever an intentional or consciously tolerated split between what I teach and what I expect and do for myself. Now it's true, I get busy and so I'm not doing the bubble baths and sometimes I let, I admit, I'll even let exercise slide, which to me is a very important self-care quality. So, um, Taryn, exercise is huge. I absolutely believe that a healthy relationship to the body is a foundation for myself as a teacher. Uh, a regular contact with nature is a foundation for myself as teacher. But what I was trying to say that is even if I let some things slip, it's, it's my commitment to never let them slip for long. And to have enough, this is also important, enough points of self-care and support so that if some drop, there will still be others in place. So for me, exercise is, is huge. Time in nature is huge. Uh, knowing yourself and what you need, so a little bit of alone time is really important for me. Boundaries to insulate my energy from when I feel demanded upon regulating how and when I can say yes and no to things. And again, knowing what feeds your soul. So for me, you know, this kind of a quarantine time is actually very good for me. I, I'm, I'm very social by personality, but introverted by nature. So lots of quiet, secluded downtime is great. Although I can't say it's downtime specifically. Seclusion is great for me. Um, and maybe the, the, the last couple of things I would add, if you're wondering about this for yourself, is you have to communicate your self-care needs in some way to the world around you so that you don't forget about it. And that might mean if you're living alone in a calendar, calendar reminders, or telling a friend over the phone. Um, if you live with people, it's, it's being explicit about what you feel you need to be healthy. In other words, a big piece of well-being for a teacher is keeping yourself accountable. And the final piece, and it looks like I'm going to have to end with this one, is, and, and the people that were in my Integrative Spiritual Practitioner Training Program know this, I believe that you have to focus on doing, or, or let me rephrase that, I focus on doing the work that continuously brings me back to the core consciousness in which all duality is subsumed, loved, and released. Which means that a lot of distress and stress comes from a pull between the way we want things and the way they, we, they are. And if you can keep your consciousness in that kind of oneness realm, that non-dual embrace of accepting, acknowledging, exploring, 
feeling and releasing things without attachment, then the drain uh, doesn't tend to happen as much. In fact, uh, a book reference for you is Ram Das, How Can I Help, written with Paul Gorman. Brilliant book to be reading at this time if you're a caregiver. And in the end, what it talks about is recognizing that you've got to give up the dualities of patient and caregiver, uh, healer and healing. We're all in this together. Neutralize the polarities. Embrace the journey. And if you can come from that place of surrender where you don't need to control and manage energy in order to be effective, but you can allow life's energy to flow through you, then as Ram Dass writes, there might be some times where you burn up a little bit, but you will never burn out. So, we are at the end of our time. I got no more questions on deck. Uh, I look forward to seeing you again soon. Sunday, please spread the word. We would really love Sundays to be a celebration of connection and seeing each other online. Sunday, 1030 here on the Althea Center Denver Facebook page. We accept donations all the time, anytime. We need, we really do need your generosity so that we can come back one day to our beautiful building and see each other and, and not be in a massive financial uh, uh, pit. We can do this. We can stay connected online. We can feel our, our togetherness online. We can grow online and we can share what we do, our love, our connection, our compassion, our acceptance, and we can we can broaden who we share that with in this special time where we're living in a virtual world. And that means people that have never seen Althea before can see it now. And people who have never heard the way we get together and the kinds of things we talk about can hear it now. So, thank you. Another crash course in life and spirit. We crammed a lot in. I'm grateful to each one of you. Uh, endless love, endless gratitude. Don't forget to share the video and mwah, we'll see you soon.